And good morning, Michigan. It's Fire Keepers of Friday. Rich Kincaid in for Michael Patrick today. Rachel Chavez is here with us, Jordan McCarlton, and uh, we're glad to have you along as all. A great thrill last night, or well, actually a disappointment, but a great thrill en route to that disappointment was uh, Michigan State loses in the opening round of the NCAA tournament 78 76 to UCLA, but boy, they were down 23 points with eight minutes to go. They were still down 10 with 90 seconds to go, and they got to within a single point. Uh, wound up losing to UCLA 78-76. It was a great basketball game, and it was so close to being one of the greatest games in NCAA tournament history. just uh, didn't quite work out that way. Gary Austin standing by uh, in the newsroom. The Detroit Free Press. Uh, Gary, I don't know if you've uh, seen the PDF about how uh, Governor Snyder's Tax proposals would affect individuals, but the one that jumps out at you, uh, it's broken down by income bracket, if you will. Hmm. Retired couple with pensions and investment income currently are paying $70 a year in, in, in state income taxes. Under the Snyder proposal, they pay 4063 hmm. So it goes wow. from $70 to 4000 It's a $4,000 increase. Well, that was a big point of contention among many retired groups, the AARP and others, a long list of protesters. It was a busy week at the Capitol, wasn't it, both inside and outside? Oh, yeah. It was, uh, it was uh, the, I don't know if you saw the uh, pictures from inside the Capitol at the peak of the rally, but it uh, recalled Madison, Wisconsin. It was, a, it was a beautiful sight to see thousands of people petitioning their government like that. Well, well thousands, thousands jammed, jammed inside, inside no, the state capitol for those, those who've never been, been there. I mean, it's a pretty big place. place. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not, not big enough to hold several thousand, thousand comfortably, and that's certainly not, not the case. case. Of course, we know the other day quite a few of those protesters, they were asked to leave by the state police and... Well, they wanted to have a sleepover, and it, it wasn't quite a few. They, they arrested five, right? Well, now it's up to um, at least 11, okay. and by some accounts as many as 14. But uh -huh. still, you're right, Rich, in the big picture, not that many. We figure how many people were jammed in there at one time. Now, here's what uh, jumps out at me. We, we just mentioned for the retired couple who, is now, who will now see their pensions taxed, hmm. their, their annual tax bill goes from $70, 70 to $4,063, so a $4,000 increase. For what the free press is referring to as an affluent working couple, that would say they're using uh, an income of two hundred ten thousand dollars. That's affluent, two hundred ten grand a year. Their taxes would go up by about five hundred dollars. So, a, 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 you know, that doesn't seem fair to me. Well, that's I tell you, there are a lot of folks who are very upset about that sort of thing, Rich. You know, some are saying you got to spread this out. Some say it is fair because those who haven't been paying for a long time should be paying more now. That's what some say. Others say, like you've just said, that this is just off the chart. Well, that all at once, such a huge financial hit is simply unfair. Let's take a low-income, single working mother with two children, right. okay, who's making $15,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So she's, she's, I'm not sure if she's uh, uh, at the poverty level, but she's darn close, right? $15,000 a year. She is currently receiving a refund of $877 with the earned income tax credit. And now, under Snyder's proposal, she would pay $166. That's a turnaround of $1,000 for somebody who's making $15,000 a year. And yet someone who's making $210,000 a year is seeing their income taxes go up by $500. Hmm. That ain't right. Well, all of this is going to be hashed out, as we know. Nothing has been finalized yet. You know, The House and Senate still have to have to go through all of this. Yes. You have to wonder too, Rich, and based on what you just said, if, if those who make the final decisions here, I mean, the governor makes the proposal, as we know how this works, House and Senate lawmakers then hash it out. You just kind of wonder if, if some of that's going to be adjusted. I mean, we'll see. see. The president of the Michigan Education Association has uh, sent a letter to his members. His, uh, uh, his name is uh, Iris Salters. He sent a letter to uh, 1,100 MEA locals asking them whether they think the union, the teachers' union, should authorize job actions up to and including illegal strikes to increase pressure on legislatures not to make a $470 per pupil cut in the state education funding. I'm not sure what the current per student level of funding is, but it seems to me it's about $1,100. So we're, we're, if that's the number, we're talking about a, a decrease of more than a third. Yeah, a, a 
education is really taking a big hit as we know in governor snyder's budget and you just kind of wonder rich and that's a good point years ago um, the state passed a law very clearly saying that teachers just aren't allowed to strike and the reason why obviously the reason why lawmakers did this a serious concern if all of a sudden a bunch of teachers walked off the job and they let's say stayed off the job for months and months and months what are the kids going to do and what are the parents going to do so it creates a real serious situation so the agreement was 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 arrived at where that was not going to be allowed but you will be curious to see if based on all that's happening if some you know, teachers and especially the teachers union says you know we just can't take this anymore we're really going to push it you know we're going to we're going to strike and you know some may say and again some may say that if in mass all of these teachers walk off the job or if a whole bunch do i mean what are you going to do if a whole bunch do it collectively i mean strength in numbers right mm -hmm. we'll see yeah, indeed we will. What do you make of this uh, situation in Libya? Oh, I just don't know. I, I don't know. While we were sleeping last night, um, the U.N. Security Council took action approving a no-fly zone, and now we have Muammar Gaddafi fighting fire with fire, shooting back, saying, you know what, if you do that, we're going to take even more extreme measures against those who want to oust me from power. So, Well, actually, they've, they've taken stronger measures than just the no-fly zone. After they approved that, they also approved the use of military force. And the United States is saying, for example, what we can do is bomb his airfields so he cannot use his air force to bomb his own people. Yeah, this is the first time this is being seriously discussed. We heard um, lawmakers from both sides on with Michael Patrick Shields last week. I remember, for example, Congressman Mike Rogers, the Republican here from the Brighton area, he was saying that the worst thing we could do is get involved in this militarily it could really open up a pandora's box but 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 that was then i mean that was a while ago several weeks ago who knows you know the situation is so fluid that you know something's got to give and you have to wonder if Gaddafi's going to stay put will it take u.s military action but we also heard carl levin say um the democrat from michigan i remember he also when referencing this um was concerned that if we did do anything like that we better be sure um all of those Middle Eastern countries are on our side because the last thing we want to do is get into a situation where we, the United States, are being portrayed as, as, as the bully, as, as, as the country that wants to intercede in something that some may contend really isn't our business, and we should let the Middle Eastern countries sort it out. But he was saying, Levin made it clear, that before we do anything, we better make sure we have countries over there on our side. Otherwise, I mean, you can only imagine the mess we could find ourselves in. The, it sounds to me, though, like we do have other countries on the uh, side of the, uh, the uh, people that want to overthrow uh, Gaddafi in That's Libya. The, the, the vote in the Security Council last night was 10 to nothing with right. China and Russia abstaining. And uh, there have been comments made by the foreign ministers of, of uh, countries uh, in the Middle East uh, that, uh, that uh, they too, uh, you know, they just don't want to see innocent civilians being slaughtered by their own government, which is what's going on right now in Libya. Yeah, that's the big concern, and I think what our lawmakers here, and certainly President Obama, wants to be very careful of. If we, you know, once you start, it, it's 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 like a ball rolling down the hill. Once you let it start rolling, you know, it can pick up steam in a hurry, and mm -hmm. it's really tough to get in front of it and stop it. If things get out of control, and we do start military action, let's say, and there are a handful of countries who think we shouldn't be doing that, and then they threaten military action against us because of our intervention. You see, we have to be very, very careful, but let's just hope the decision makers, if they do decide to uh, pursue that option, they, they think this out very carefully because it's obvious what, what the long-term, I mean long, long-term ramifications could be if we get involved in this militarily. Well, I always remember what President Kennedy uh, said. Uh, it's a lot easier to get into a war than it is to uh, to get out of a war. Well, so you, you know, you, again, yeah, exactly. Talk to those who orchestrated our, our situation in Korea and, mm -hmm. and of course Vietnam. And it's now the tenth anniversary of the uh, start of the Iraq War. That was last night. Ten years. Can you believe that? Since uh, ten years. No, no, I can't. No, I'm sorry. I'm I'm speaking. Eight years mm -hmm. since uh, shock and awe. You know, the uh, anniversary of the shock and awe bombing in Baghdad. But it was eight years ago uh, last night. Amazing. No, uh, the uh, but it, I guess uh, I told you it seems at least ten years or maybe longer. I well, mean, it seems like we're. And of course, the question is. I mean, there's another case in point. I mean, we're we're targeting pullouts um, from that part of the world, and and now we're having you know that's this this discussion. Well, we've been in Afghanistan for yeah, ten. That's right. Yeah, and, and and that's the big concern. I mean, how long is too long? I mean, we just can't. I mean, some say we just can't cut and run until the job is done. 
And others say we can't set a, a, a time frame on when we should pull out because then the Taliban and others who don't like us will just wait until we leave, wait us out, and well, then they'll do their thing. there's a long history of uh, peoples doing that. That was the story in Vietnam. Eventually, you will wear them down. And, and Afghanistan, as we know, as history teaches us, that's where empires go to die. It, it, it ruined the Soviet Union because they got in and, 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 and couldn't get out. Anyways, Gary, thanks as always. It's been a pleasure working with yes, you this oh, week. Rich. Oh, you bet. It, it, my pleasure, too. I, I've just got to add this one more point here, a big story involving this whole business involving the, the nuclear leak and yes. that mess in Japan. We have data suggesting radiation from a crippled Japanese nuclear power plant may reach the West Coast later today. Mm -hmm. Um, how severe this will be. Some are saying it's going to be no big deal. But others are saying we've got to wait and see. So that's going to happen later today as well. We'll keep an eye on that. All right, All right Gary, thanks so much. Oh, by the way, Rich, this update, a service of our friends at American Metal Roofs. You can learn more at AmericanMetalRoofs.com. That's AmericanMetalRoofs.com, a beautiful, guaranteed American metal roof. Thank you, Gary. We'll hear from uh, Michigan State basketball coach Tom Izzo as we continue here on Firekeepers Friday on Michigan's Morning Show with Michael Patrick Shields. Rich Kincaid in for Michael Patrick on uh, this Friday. Rachel Chavez and Jordan McAlton uh, are here with us in the studio on this Firekeepers Friday. And it's uh, certainly good to be with you. Michigan State's NCAA tournament run came to an abortive first round and last night. Boy, the Spartans almost pulling off one of the greatest comebacks, not just in NCAA tournament history, but uh, one suspects just in basketball history in general. The Spartans were down 23 points with about eight minutes to go last night, 64 to 41. And from that point on, they outscored UCLA 36 to 14, actually got it to within one point, trailing 77 76 with a dozen seconds or so to go on the clock, and uh, had an opportunity with a last shot to maybe uh, tie or, or hit a three and win the game last night, but they didn't get a shot off as Kalen Lucas was called for traveling. I thought it was a iffy call because I thought maybe he was fouled before the travel, but at any rate, Michigan State bows out of the tournament in the first round. I think a lot of people probably left that game with eight minutes to go and stayed down by 23 points, but for those who stayed, they saw quite a show. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, it didn't turn out uh, the way Michigan State, their fans, or Spartan coach Tom Izzo had hoped. You know, I'm crushed and disappointed because we uh, we just got off to such a poor start, and yet I'm so proud of these guys for they've been knocked down so many times this year that uh, I don't think I've ever had a team that's gone through as much. Tom Izzo was summing up the game and the season, and indeed Michigan State did get off to a slow start last night. They trailed 7 nothing before the game was two minutes old. They were way down. I think they were down by 18 points at halftime, 42 to 24. And as we say, they were down by 23 with eight minutes to go. And boy, they uh, they made a game of it. They uh, they did not go quietly into that night. Here's a Spartan Draymond Green with his thoughts on oh, what could have been. I think the most important thing was our energy level picked up a lot. And you know, first half we we pretty much came out dead and dug ourselves too deep of a hole. Oh. Did a great job of fighting back, but I mean, we fell two points too many down and just couldn't come back from it. They couldn't. Uh, boy, they, uh, they, uh, they certainly tried, however. Let's run down the finals of the 16 games played in the tournament uh, yesterday. The uh, winner of the UCLA-Michigan State game, UCLA advances to play Florida. Florida knocked off UC Santa Barbara 79-51. Also in the Southeast, BYU 74, Wofford 66, and Gonzaga beat St. John's. There was the uh, uh, big upset there. But Gonzaga, they've got a history of pulling upsets in the tournament. 86-71 the final score, so Gonzaga and BYU meet in the next round. Wisconsin was in a tight game early against Belmont. Uh, wound up winning pretty much going away, beat them by 14, 72-58. And Kansas State over Utah State, 73-68. So K-State and Wisconsin hook up in round number two, which they're now calling round number three because they count those silly playing games as a round. Uh, Butler beat Old Dominion 60 to 58. Uh, Butler, of course, the uh, surprise team of the tournament last year, going all the way to the title game. Pittsburgh over 
U uh, NC Asheville, one of the teams that had played into the tournament, Pittsburgh beat them 74-51. Butler and Pittsburgh meet to tomorrow. Elsewhere, uh, Moorhead State over Louisville, 62-61. That's the big upset of the day as number 13 Moorhead State beat Louisville. We were talking, uh, Jordan, uh, 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 a short time ago about how it was either last year or the year before last year, ESPN had a national contest, a national pool, if you will, and out of over 8 million entries received, only one person had picked the score of every game, not the score, but the winner of every game in the tournament correctly. So your odds of doing it, uh, just based on that, are about 8 million to 1. But uh, you tell me that uh, Nate Silver of 538.com, a guy I've got a lot of respect for, actually picked that Moorhead State upset. He's got to be the only guy in the country that did that. Maybe a few Moorhead State players' moms might have had that upset, but uh, probably not a whole lot of professionals picked that one. Yeah, exactly right. They knock uh, Louisville out 62-61. to 61. Richmond over Vanderbilt 69-66. That's another upset. Did Nate have that one? Because that's a 12 beating a 5. I think he did. Those 12 fives are a little more common. Come on. Wow. Yeah, 12. He's pretty good. <laughs> what can you say? Richmond and Moorhead State meet uh, tomorrow in the next round of the tournament. Over in the uh, East Regional, West Virginia beat Clemson 84-76. Kentucky over Princeton 59-57 as the Tigers almost pulled off the upset. In the West Regional, uh, Cincinnati, is it a region or regional? Yeah, either one's good. Cincinnati beat uh, Missouri 78-63. Connecticut over Bucknell 81-52. Temple beat Penn State 66-64. Penn State tied the game with 2.2 seconds to go, and then Temple won it with two-tenths of a second to go as uh, somebody hit a runner in the, in the paint. It looked like an impossible shot, but off the glass, and then Temple wins as time expires. And San Diego State with Steve Fisher beat Northern Colorado 68-50. Here are the games today. In the East Regional at 4.40, it's Ohio State taking on UT San Antonio. George Mason plays Villanova. Winner of that one will play, well, probably Ohio State, wouldn't you think? Xavier and Marquette, they'll tip at 7.27 tonight. Syracuse and Indiana State, they play at 9.57 tonight. Also, Washington and Georgia, that's at 9.45. North Carolina and Long Island at 7.15. In the West Regional, Duke takes on Hampton. That's a 3.10 tip. Michigan and Tennessee, they will play at 12.40 this afternoon. They're playing in Charlotte. Uh, you always, you know, it's Charlotte, North Carolina, but it's Charlotte, Michigan. And when you do a lot of radio here in mid-Michigan, your default switches from Charlotte which is like 99% of the country, is what they say, to Charlotte. But they're playing in Charlotte, uh, Michigan and Tennessee, at 1240 this afternoon. Arizona meets Memphis at two, to, uh, tw I'm sorry, 245. And at 1215, you've got Texas and Oakland playing in Tulsa. So you've got the Michigan game and the Oakland game at the same time. So one thing I really enjoyed yesterday was the availability of the games on computer. Uh, you can just switch back and forth. You get a nice high-def feed. I really enjoyed myself. Once again, I, I think uh, I was uh, up to do the show uh, about a month or two ago, and uh, I did something in a hotel room I had never, ever done before. <laughs> Scary detail, but go yeah, ahead. Okay. I never turned the TV set on. You know, just plugged in the computer. I was getting everything I needed from the computer, and I never bothered to turn the – and I've been – I think I've been up there four nights this week. I have not turned the TV set on once, except I brought my daughter's GameCube so I could play the Tiger Woods Golf. Tiger's kicking my butt. And, uh, uh, well, Laura's hilarious. You are not taking my GameCube. You know, it'll get stolen. I said, no, no, it's a good hotel. Over there at the Comfort Inn, they treat us great on Lansing Road. Terrific hotel, actually. It's got all you can want. It's got the pool. It's got the hot tub. It's got the breakfast in the morning. So I'm very comfortable there. Well, I'm glad to hear the Tiger's beating you on the GameCube. That's about the only place he's winning these days. Yeah, I guess, huh? And, and he's. Uh, uh, but I'm excited. You mentioned the other morning the next Tiger Woods Golf will feature Augusta National. That's very exciting for so, the first time. Have you ever been down there, by the way? I haven't. I you know what? I, I got to. I got to go once yeah. for a. Pra it was just a practice round, but you're still there, and to 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 walk those fairways, you know, and, and to see it in person, you know, it was a. It was a it was a pretty big thrill. Other games in the NCAA tournament uh, coming up today over in the Southwest region, uh, Kansas and Boston University, a 1 versus 16 matchup. UNLV, and that's at 6.50. UNLV plays Illinois. That's at 9.20 tonight. A lot of good games tonight. Also at 9.50 tonight, Georgetown and Virginia Commonwealth. 
Purdue plays at 720. I kind of like them. I, I, you know, I'd like that Purdue team. What might, what might they have been like without uh, losing their injured star? Uh, two years in a row, too. Robbie Hummel. Robbie Hummel, exactly. Man, oh man. But they yeah. do still look good in the tournament. I but they look pretty good in the Big Ten. They look pretty good against Michigan State during the regular season. And then State, I think the, the, the reason State got in the tournament was beating Purdue in the NCAA tournament is the reason is because they beat Purdue in the Big Ten at tournament. Purdue and St. Peter's, that's at 720 tonight. Texas A&M and Florida State go at 410. At 140, Notre Dame against Akron. Anybody think Akron can pull an upset on that one? I don't know. Um, well, that's why we play the games. And there are no games in the Southeast region today because, uh, well, everybody played yesterday to open the tournament. Okay, so we're all caught up to date on your brackets. Hopefully you're doing well. I don't think anybody's doing as well as Nate Silver, though. He picked that Moorhead State-Louisville upset, which is uh, certainly hard to believe. Been a good week for the Red Wings. They knocked off the Capitals at home on Wednesday, 3-2. to two. Took it on the road at last night to take on the Columbus Blue Jackets, and the Red Wings are closing in. I've got to look this up to see if it's a record. But the Wings are closing in now on a, uh, another 100-point season. 100-point seasons used to be the gold standard. It, uh, it, it did not happen very often. It, it happens more often now be, simply because teams play more games. It's an 82-game schedule. I think when I was growing up, it was like a 70-game schedule. So you're going to amass more points. But the Wings are on the uh, cusp of another 100-point season, which I think is going to be seven or eight in a row, maybe more. Uh, as I say, we'll look that up. In fact, we'll look it up after we hear, or while we hear, from the voice of the Red Wings, Ken Cal, about last night's 2 nothing victory over the Blue Jackets in Columbus. Joey McDonald stopped 37 shots as the Red Wings shut out the Blue Jackets 2 to nothing last night in Columbus. The win was Detroit's fourth straight victory. Drew Miller, who got into a fight with Derek McKenzie, scored the opening goal of the game 33 seconds into the first period. Valtteri Filppula also netted a power play goal as the Red Wings led 2-0 after 20 minutes of play. McDonald stopped 14 Blue Jacket shots, and some of those shots and saves spectacular for the Red Wing netminder. Neither team scored in the second period. Pavel Datsuk, Brian Rafalski left the game in the third, didn't finish the hockey game. They were shaken up. Uh, Joey McDonald shut down the Blue Jackets the rest of the way, stopping 37 Columbus shots in the contest. Final again from Nationwide Arena, Detroit 2 and the Blue Jackets nothing. That's the story from Columbus. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ken. The uh, Wings, two nothing winners over the uh, Columbus Blue Jackets last night. Oh, you know what? Uh, oh, no, no, they do. The, 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 I'm looking at a website that shows the Red Wings in their most recent season with 92 points, but that's the current season. So, And I'm not sure that's up to date, uh, as a matter of fact. I'll check the standings real quick, but at any rate, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 consecutive 100-point seasons for the Red Wings heading into this, uh, heading into this season. So they, they started out with a 108-point season back in 1999 when they had 108 points. And, uh, boy, you look at this, and, and only two times, and only three, only three times since 1992-93 have the Wings failed to make the 100-point uh, mark. So they've had a tremendous run here over the course of the last 20 years, which sort of makes up for the awful run they had the 30 years leading up to that, uh, that uh, start of the run back in 1990. We're caught up on the Tigers' won an exhibition play over the Twins 4-3. Yesterday, Ryan Rayburn hit a dinger, a walk-off to win that one for the Tigers. All right, uh, we're up to date on sports. Take a break. Be back with more from the American Metal Roofs studio. You are listening to Michigan's Morning Show with Michael Patrick Shields. with you this week. Michael Patrick will be back on Monday. It is Firekeepers Friday, and uh, we're going to uh, begin uh, thinking about our Northwood University uh, leader of the day, Northwood University, promoting free enterprise and celebrating 51 years of producing leaders. Boy, what a great day it was uh, yesterday as uh, we got up to, uh, I know people are having problems with their, uh, now we're having just a little issue with the headphones here, but you can hear me, right? Okay. I, I can hear you fine. We're good. I, okay. The, yesterday, I, I, I stepped outside uh, the uh, hotel in the afternoon and uh, found I didn't need a coat exactly. Got wow. up to as high as 69 yesterday here in East Lansing. Wow. And, and, and warmer, presumably, and 
many of the other uh, or all the 12 markets that uh, that uh, we're uh, addressing here from our studios just in the uh, shadow of the uh, state capitol so that felt uh, pretty good and i noticed pulling up this morning there has been uh, there's like has, has been every day uh even this week like a two-foot snowdrift and it's it's there's still a little there but it's almost all gone it's still hanging in now i'll tell you what if they can get up if it could be 69 degrees when the tigers play their home opener which is like three weeks away i think it might be three weeks from today as a matter of fact they, you know you certainly would take that oh so we we'll, we'll take it any day here in michigan I remember much. one year i uh, got sent to cleveland to cover the tigers opener and they decided and it one o'clock in the afternoon, it was nearly 60 degrees, sunshine. It was a lovely day. But they had decided to increase the gate to make it easier for people to leave work and come to opening day. They, they decided to have first pitch at like 4.05. And by 4 o'clock, the sun had gone down or was close to the edge of the stadium. Uh, and being that it's opening day, there wasn't, the press box is packed. So they didn't have room for some guy from Detroit so they gave me a seat in the stands under the overhang, and I, got, and I, w- I, d- I was not dressed to be outside. I just assumed I'd be in the press box. And I, like, froze. I was so cold, a buddy of mine had to go conduct the post-game interviews for me. I was shivering. I was just shaking. And, and, you know, I almost died of hypothermia right there at Cleveland Municipal Stadium. That's how long ago this was, by the way. They weren't even playing at Jacobs Field. I was still at the, uh, we were still at the mistake by the lake. So uh, that's my uh, opening day uh, memory. Uh, well, we were talking about uh, a couple of years ago, ESPN had 8 million submissions for their uh, 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 NCAA tournament bracket. And one person out of 8 million picked correctly the winning team in all 64 games. Well, there were a couple upsets in round one yesterday. Now, what are, what are the ESPN statistics in that regard now? So detail pass along by Tony Cuthbert. Uh, out of the 5.9 million bracket submissions so far from ESPN.com, only 317 remain perfect. What's the percentage on that? Like we get, let's run a little quick math Do a little here. fast math there. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Just bring up your calculator. But what it, again, the numbers were? 5.9 million. Okay. And 317 are perfect. Wow. In one day, you go from, well, it's going to be something infinitesimally, you know, fraction of 1%. 317 out of over 5 million. Wow. So, but it goes to show you, you know, how, uh, how difficult uh, this, uh, this whole thing is. But, you know, fear not, friends, because the, uh, the, the, the good news here is you can just be uh, looking horrible through three rounds. But if one of the teams you've got is still alive and they go on and win it, well, that's how you win the pool. So, uh, so no reason to to uh, to uh, give up hope uh, at this uh, at this point. That's pretty good. Three hundred seventeen still alive with a chance to be perfect over five over five million submissions. And of course, with Michigan State uh, losing last night. Set, go ahead. Oh well, I was just going to say I, I still didn't get the math, but we also found out that uh, President Obama, in fact, had. 14 out of 16 picks right yesterday. Not too bad. Pretty, you know, I saw, I saw a bunch of uh, 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 yeah, comments on, on my Facebook and whatnot. You know, with everything going on in the world, how come he's got, you know, wasting time filling out a bracket? Well, you know what? Let me tell you. First off, he probably has people doing that for him, you know. And even if he doesn't, how long does it take to fill out a bracket? Ten Fun. minutes, maybe. Maybe most. I was thinking five. And he's probably getting a briefing while he's doing it. You know, one I mean, give me a break. You know, I mean, George W. Bush used to nap for a couple hours every afternoon in a time of wartime, you know, and people are giving Obama grief for filling out a bracket. You know, it's just it's one of the things that maybe connects him to us a little bit, shows he's a regular kind of guy, you know, and I also heard some uh, stuff about him, some criticism because he was out playing a round of golf, you know. Well, he's not the first president to, to play a round of golf. And with the responsibilities of this office, excuse me for going off on a rant here, I would prefer that the guy take a break every once in a while and just relax and clear your head. And what better way to do that than playing a round of golf? And I'm pretty sure we all know you can get a little bit of business done on the golf course. I'm pretty sure there was some talk, some chat. I suppose. You're the uh, girls, go- g- girls, women's golf coach at Albion? Yep, Albion College. So, I mean, you're, so you're, what does a golf coach do exactly? Hey, now. No, no, I'm, I'm just asking because, I mean, like a basketball coach, you're going to draw up plays and everything, but you can't draw up a play for a, for a golfer. 
it's 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 a little tough to to make a whole lot of changes while you're on the golf course. Yeah. For the most part, we just try and work with the players about maintaining a good mental attitude while mm -hmm. you're out there, uh, forgetting about maybe bad stuff that's already happened. Uh, do you have do you, uh, do you have match play tournaments where you're trying to get an advantageous matchup with your opponent? No, not okay. really. Yeah. Uh, we're mostly a stroke play. Uh, yeah. Okay. League. Yeah. But, okay. Um, yeah. I mean, there's certainly a, a real mental side of the so game. So what's your handicap? Um, I'm about maybe a two at this really? point. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. I wish I was a two. <laughs> so I think the best I ever got was like a seven. Okay. When I was playing That's really good. well. And yeah, it was, it's, you know, and as Jack Nicholas once said, it's more fun when you're playing well. Oh, he knew a lot about golf. All right, we'll take a break. Uh, we're going to come back and talk uh, with the director of the Michigan State University Marching Band. John Madden is going to be our guest next as we continue here from the American Metal Roos studio. This is Michigan's Morning Show with Michael Patrick Shields. Michael Patrick on Michigan's Morning Show with Michael Patrick Shields. Michael will be back with you on Monday. He's probably going to be jet lag. They're flying back on uh, Sunday. He's making the most of that uh, trip to Ireland. I just thought it was a terrific show yesterday with uh, the uh, being in Ireland and talking to the authentic Irish people uh, on St. Patrick's Day. And it struck me as uh, interesting that uh, there he was on the air, and you could see reporters from the local newspapers uh, there to uh, take pictures. So it was a media event in Ireland while Michael Patrick was uh, on the air. Here's a headline that uh, struck me. It, it, uh, it confused me uh, momentarily. The uh, headline, it uh, says, uh, Probe Achieves First Mercury Orbit. Being an, uh, an old guy, I remember a Mercury orbit was a big deal. Mercury was the first uh, manned orbital uh, spacecraft that the United States had, John Glenn. Uh, went up in a Mercury space spacecraft. We had, I believe, six Mercury flights. Two were suborbital flights that occurred in 1961. And then in February 62, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. And he was the biggest deal in America since Charles Lindbergh. Okay? So Mercury was our first uh, manned space flight program. It was our first fledgling step towards uh, making it to the moon. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, this... You know, there's got to be some sort of misprint here if we're talking about a Mercury orbit. Well, what happened is, in point of fact, uh, the United States has sent a probe up, and it is now orbiting Mercury. And it is the first spacecraft so to do. And Mercury, of course, the closest planet to the sun, and I'm just scanning the article uh, quickly here to, to see just how hot it is. And it, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not seeing uh, anything on that. But, of course, that close to the sun, it's got to be... Thousands, hundreds, thousands of degrees. I'm thinking thousands. I think it's safe to say very hot. Yeah, exactly. But uh, there's uh, there's some uh, pretty interesting pictures of Mercury. This is the best look we've ever had at uh, at the planet closest to the sun. Uh, you can check them out on CNN.com, and it looks kind of like the moon, albeit a bit more colorful. Uh, the moon, while well, there's no color whatsoever on the moon, according to those who walked on the moon, uh, but uh, uh, you know, looks uh, looks fairly uh, colorful right there. My uh, when my daughter was a little baby girl, I used to put her to sleep. Well, I, I, well, talking about baseball, I, I do that. But I taught her uh, all. She she could recite the names of the original seven Mercury astronauts. I'm not sure if I can do it right now. Yeah, let's see. You had uh, uh, Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, uh, Wally Schirra, John Glenn, Gordon Cooper, uh, and I can't remember the names of the uh, the other two. I mean, I would, but it's going to take a minute, and that's not, not a good way to kill time on the radio. But I taught those to her, and then once she had those effectively memorized, I taught her all about the Apollo 11 mission, the, the first lunar mission where Neil Armstrong was the first man to set foot on the moon and Buzz Aldrin was the second man to set foot on the moon. And what a lot of people forget is that there was a third astronaut on that crew who did not get to go to the moon, but Michael Collins was up in the command module circling the moon while his two fellow astronauts took the lunar excursion, the aptly named lunar excursion module down to the moon, and they were the guys that got to walk on the moon. And poor Michael Collins was, at least for a time, the loneliest man in the history of mankind. He'd be on the far side of the moon, no communications at all because the moon would block all transmissions, and he was as alone as you can possibly be. Well, my daughter in her history class a few months ago, the uh, history teacher is trying to trip her up. And, and he says, because this happened in 69. This is like a quarter century before she's born. 
And uh, he says, well, I bet you don't know who the first man on the moon was. And Laura says, Neil Armstrong. And he goes, really? Well, who was second? She says, Buzz Aldrin. And she goes, yeah, well, he goes, well, yeah, well, who else was on that flight? And she goes, Michael Collins. And he's just like, how do you know that? You know, but yeah, she could tell you when she was a little girl and probably still can, that Charles Lindbergh, uh, in the spirit of St. Louis, departed Roosevelt Field in May of 1927 and landed at Le Bourget, uh, you know, something like two days later, day and a half later, whatever, however long that, that flight took, because I would teach her this minutia just as a way of getting her imagination kind of stoked up a little bit. And also, you know, some factual information that it's not, you know, all facts are good facts, I suppose. But uh, it finally, after all those nights, uh, you know, it paid off, off in, that, uh, in that history class. Our other favorite, of course, was Three Billy Goats Gruff, which I would, even when I was on the road traveling with the Griffins, if I wasn't there at home to tell her her night-night story, which was Three Billy Goats Gruff, which involves the three Billy Goats who go over the bridge, and there's a troll that's trying to eat them, but they escape, and they get to the sweet green clover on the other side, just to give you the Cliff Notes version of it. Even when I was on the road, I'd have to pick up the phone and tell her that story, you know, over the phone, just to, to you know, put her to sleep at night. It is fun being a dad. Now, Rich, have you seen the video of Buzz Aldrin uh, lighting up one of those uh, doubters of uh, whether or not... Oh, yeah. The moon? Yeah, this was a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah he, he, he got fed up and he took a swing at the guy. Wrong, wrong guy to mess with. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I didn't blame him uh, a, a bit uh, for that. All right, uh, we got Nikki Hale coming up in the next hour, our world correspondent. Always a delight when she drops by to visit us here at the American Metal Roos studio in the shadow of the state capitol. And we're also going to uh, visit with uh, Congressman Bill Heizinga. We'll talk to him about uh, the uh, situation in Libya and uh, so much more. Rich Kincaid in for Michael Patrick as Michigan's morning show with Michael Patrick Shields continues. Good morning, Michigan, and we welcome you to Michigan's Morning Show with Michael Patrick Shields. Rich Kincaid filling in today. Michael will be back. Michael Patrick will be back on Monday. Rachel Chavez is here filling in for Amanda and uh, Jordan McCarlton uh, here to keep things moving along as we join you here on Fire Keepers uh, Friday. Good to be with you. Great basketball game last night. Well, it didn't turn out well. State lost to UCLA, as you by now know, 78-76, to but it turned out to be a great basketball game after it looked like it was time to go to bed at halftime. State was down 18 at the break. They looked horrible. They fell behind 7 nothing, and the game was not yet two minutes old, and it just looked like a replay of that Michigan at, I should say, Michigan State at Michigan game, the last game of the regular season, where I think uh, Michigan was had something like 15-3 to three at the three-minute mark. And it looked like State was going to get blown out early, and indeed they were being blown out. They were down 23, 64-41 with eight minutes to go, and they came roaring back. From that point on, they outscored UCLA 36-14, to actually made it a one-point game with uh, 12 seconds to go, something on that order. Um, UCLA made a free throw. And then uh, State had a chance. Well, UCLA was inbounding the ball from underneath the Michigan State basket. And on their first attempt, they couldn't get it in, or they were afraid they weren't going to be able to get the, the, the ball inbounded in the five seconds that you have to inbound the ball. So UCLA called its final timeout. And then they had to try and uh, inbound again. And uh, this time... Uh, before and it, again, they were having trouble getting the ball in. But one of the Spartans fouled a Bruin, and I just I wish that uh, they uh, hadn't gone ahead and done that because maybe UCLA, UCLA doesn't get the ball in, and State would have had the ball in the offensive zone with 4.4 seconds to go. But uh, State did foul, and UCLA went down, made one of the free throws to make it 78-76. But State with only 4.4 seconds to go unable to get the ball down the court and get that final shot. Really damaged them in another way, too, which is because the foul had come before the ball was inbounded, they weren't able to make any substitutions, which right. uh, you would think wouldn't be a big deal, but oftentimes the substitutes will send in a play or something organized yeah. for that last second play. Yeah. Instead, it was chaotic. So it was, yeah, it was nearly one of the greatest comebacks, not only in NCAA tournament history, but in college basketball history uh I mean, period, end of story. But State comes up on the short end, 78-76. Michigan in action this afternoon against uh, Tennessee. And Oakland University plays Texas. Those two games will be going on at the same time 
in the noon hour today. They are they don't start at exactly the same time. Michigan, Tennessee, that tips at 1240 today. And then Texas Oakland, not and then Texas Oakland actually begins a few minutes before that at 1215. So the two games of local interest uh, beginning in the noon hour today. The nice thing is, I don't know if anybody's checked this out, but you can watch all the games on your computer now. That's a new feature this year. I really enjoyed that last night, switching back and forth between the games. And uh, we, uh, we got to see a lot of uh, quality basketball last night. We're joined on the other end of our line right now by Congressman Bill Heizenga. Good morning, Congressman. How are you? Hey, good morning, Rich. We're doing all right. Okay. The, uh, the situation in, uh, in Libya has actually, in some quarters, uh, surpassed the news from Japan. Uh, the uh, United Nations, I don't have to tell you, but just to inform the audience, uh, the uh, U.N. Security Council voting 10 to nothing last night with China and Russia abstaining to uh, create, declare a no-fly zone in Libya. And they've gone beyond that. They've authorized the use of military force to prevent Muammar Gaddafi from using his military on his own people. What's your take on what's going on in Libya right now? Certainly, it's uh, it's taken a, a bit longer than uh, a lot of us would like to see. I mean, it, it, this is uh, this is a problem, but I'm I'm very glad it's not us just going in unilaterally. This has to be an Arab League and or African uh, uh, organization uh, response and uh, and across the board with the UN. So, um, you know, I mean, we we've all seen those uh, those pictures of the, the bombings and and the shellings that have been going on and. Uh, I think it's just once again you know, another hot spot for freedom that's uh, that's happening in the Middle East. What? Uh, how likely do you think it's going to be that uh, this will come to military action? Some of the uh, things I've read about uh, this morning is that there will be airstrikes. It's likely to be airstrikes to uh, bomb the runways of Libyan military installations so that Gaddafi cannot use his fighter planes to strafe and bomb his own people. Well, uh, again, it's you know it has to be an Arab League or UN uh, type of a response, and and uh, you know what, it, there's there is no perfect situation in this. That is for sure. Uh, as uh, you know, you've been seeing Al Qaeda calling for the uh, overthrow of Gaddafi. Uh, there's going to be a struggle that's going to be going on there, but uh, we just hope it's going to be as orderly and peaceful as possible. What? Uh, uh Assurances, or what? What is your feeling on uh, solidarity uh, within the Arab Union? I'm sorry, within the Arab League. Yes, yes, the Arab League. Yes. Yeah, I, they're they are <laughs> they're very split as well. I mean, certainly the, uh, the, the 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 Saudis are very nervous about what's been happening in Bahrain and, and Yemen and some of the other areas. Uh, so I, I think, in many ways, they haven't been able to figure it out themselves, which is causing. A lot of the uh, paralysis, frankly, on action. Um, I, you know, someone they have been working it uh, in behind the scenes to be able to get China and Russia to abstain. Uh, there had been uh, there had been quite a, uh, a, a past relationship, especially with Russia, is not my understanding with uh, with Libya. And, uh, so I, I just think it's so egregious what he is doing, and and uh, and uh, it is is just so over the top that it just finally became inevitable. But again, it has to be led, I believe, internally by the Arabs. What's the uh, latest you've heard on the situation in Japan? I, uh, driving in this morning, heard some of the most uh, heartbreaking uh, comments that, uh, that uh, maybe I've ever heard on the radio. They were interviewing... Uh, uh, a little boy whose uh, dad was one of those workers, is one of those workers, who is trying to put out the fire and effect a containment on the Japanese nuclear disaster. And he said that uh, his mother was just crying and crying because, uh, you know, obviously uh, his father, her husband, is going into one of the most uh, dangerous, deadly uh, situations imaginable. Uh, and, and much like you, I was uh, I was listening to the radio as well, trying to trying to catch up on some of the news. And um, it, it is I'm reminded of uh, when Chernobyl uh, happened. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a uh, there was a helicopter crew and a helicopter pilot specifically that went in time after time after time trying to cap it with concrete. And he ended up dying a, a, a number of years ago because he just had so much massive radiation that uh, that affected him but he knew that he needed to cap this thing. And that's the type of personal sacrifice 
that we saw, whether it was uh, you know with us at 9/11 uh, in New York, and so many times we're seeing that type of response from people, and uh, you know it, it's people wanting to make sure that the future generations are uh, are going to be okay on it, and you know I just our thoughts and prayers go out to, to those people working uh, on the nuclear uh, plant itself, but. Obviously, the tens of thousands, it appears, uh, of people that have uh, been killed and disappeared and the families that have just been devastated by this. What uh, information are you getting with respect to radioactive material reaching the United States? It's supposed to uh, appear today, later on today, uh, at the California coast. Some are saying it's not going to be any sort of a big deal at all. President Obama yesterday said people should not be concerned it seems to others, and I guess I would find, I'd put myself in that group, that since you don't know how much radioactive material has been reached, uh, released in the first place, it's hard to make a statement uh, saying that it, it poses no threat. Uh, it, it is difficult to make that, and, and uh, we all hope and pray that it is not serious. Uh, we, uh, we've been having some conversations with uh, and getting some updates from from uh, organizations like the CDC and uh, that, uh, that that those types of organizations that, who are who are taking a look at this and and uh, and they're trying to make sure that this isn't uh, this isn't a problem. Uh, you know, most of the quote unquote experts are saying it's not going to be. It's uh, and we obviously don't want to cause panic with that, but I, I think people just need to be cautious uh, and, uh, and 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 use some common sense on it, but. Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, it does appear at this point that uh, it's not going to be significant as it's coming over us. Yeah, I, I don't know how much uh, concern is warranted by this. The Japanese government is saying that uh, a uh, an evacuation zone within 13 miles of the reactor is sufficient. However, the United States is telling its people they want them 50 mi 50 miles, not 13 yeah. miles, but 50 miles away from the reactor. Yeah, that's what I was uh, hearing as well on some of those updates. Is uh, you know our uh, our scientists are saying we need a uh, a larger uh, uh, zone around those uh, around those areas. And um, hey, this is Japan has seen uh, seen the effects of radiation and and uh, and nuclear power like none other, uh, going back to those first original bombs dropping on them. And uh, they uh, they they have had a complicated history with. Uh, uh, with nuclear energy, and uh, you know, again, our just our thoughts and prayers go out to them, and and obviously we hope that it doesn't significantly impact uh, the rest of the world. And much like we saw in Chernobyl back uh, a number of years ago, uh, you know, this is the type of thing that does have a worldwide effect, but uh, we uh, we hope it's going to be minimal. Well, Congressman be staying on top of these situations both in Japan and in Libya. I hope you'll keep us informed as well. We sure will, and. Uh, uh, good to hear from you, Rich, and uh, and well, I think we all wish we were with Michael Patrick right now. I understand yeah. he's uh, he's in, in the in the old country. Yeah, he's having a great time. Did a great show yesterday from Ireland, Congressman. Thanks for your time. We appreciate it. All right, thank you, Bill Heisinger, the uh, Congressman, joining us here from uh, Michigan's Second District, uh, joining us here on Michigan's Morning Show with Michael Patrick Shields, Nikki Hales, our world con con our world correspondent, uh, is here with us, and uh, she will join us next. You are listening to Michigan's Morning Show with Michael Patrick Shields. And it's Firekeepers Friday. Rich Kincaid in for Michael Patrick today. He had a great time yesterday in Ireland. Will for the next uh, couple of days before they fly back, uh, when I say they, he and Amanda K. Wall, uh, fly back on Sunday, and they will be back here in studio on Monday. Reading a uh, story here from Bloomberg News, uh, and I'll quote uh, a bit of it for you. The unfolding disaster at the Fukushima nuclear power plant follows decades of falsified safety reports, fatal accidents, and an underestimated earthquake risk in Japan's overall atomic power industry. The destruction caused by last week's 9.0 earthquake and the tsunami which followed it comes less than four years after a 6.8 quake shut down the world's biggest atomic plant, also run by Tokyo Electric Power Company. 
In 2002 and 2007, revelations came uh, that the utility had faked repair records and which uh, at that time forced the resignation of the company's chairman and president and a three-week shutdown of all 17 of their reactors in Japan. The other thing that kind of jumped out at me, and I didn't realize this, the plant, that uh, Fukushima nuclear power plant, is 40 years old. And uh, again, you just wonder what sort of a lifespan these, uh, these uh, power plants are built for. But uh, 40 years, one would think, is pressing the outer limit. Nikki Hale, our world correspondent in studio with us now. Nikki, the uh, radioactive particles, uh, we've been uh, actually been talking about this since uh, Tuesday. Uh, when uh, I, I saw a graph, uh, I think it was from the uh, CBC, which indicated that the uh, radioactive particles, once they reached the jet stream, would mm -hmm. be traveling at 50 miles an hour and would therefore reach the California coast on Friday, today, and that is exactly what's happening. The problem is uh, Japan and their nuclear power plant people have not, in most quarters, been seen to have uh, given us uh, thorough, complete, honest information on uh, just how much uh, radioactivity has been released. It is therefore difficult to, to, to speculate on, uh, on what sort of damage, if any, uh, this radioactive material will cause once it gets to California. And also, that same graph that, we're, that we were looking at indicated that, again, with uh, those materials in the jet stream, they would reach Chicago two days later, that Sunday, and we were also right here in Lansing and in, in West Michigan you know, in that track as long as the jet stream stays uh, where it is. So we could be feeling uh, some effects right here in Lansing. Again, though, how severe, nobody knows. But it's something to think about. Right, absolutely. And um, I don't think we're going to feel any effects from that, though. Um, when you're talking about the jet stream, it's so far up that it's not something that we're actually going to feel down on Earth level. But it's definitely a, a note for concern. You're absolutely right. The Japanese right now are focusing on the issues they have with the nuclear power plant. And so they're not going to be, th their priority is not going to be warning the other countries on what you know, nuclear leaks have happened. They're trying to control the situation on the ground over there, which is their priority. Um, but you're right, being that they are supposed to be a close ally to the United States and that Obama and the president of Japan are talking consistently, you'd think there'd be some more communication happening there. But it's not a priority for them, being that the devastation they've just gone through. Well, uh, President Obama said yesterday that uh, he does not expect any ill effects. So when that radioactive material reaches the West Coast, mm -hmm. it will have been so dissipated by the time it gets here, it won't... Uh, pose a threat, but, uh, you know, it, 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 when this disaster uh, was uh, developing last weekend, you know, my daughter had some concerns about that, and I says, well, who knows? Maybe Japan's the only government in the history of uh, civilization that tells its people the truth, and maybe it isn't that bad. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, most governments will try to hide something. Right, and then you've got to also remember that um, if it was reversed, if that had happened here, what, how many fingers are pointing in our direction? So I think we have the right somewhat to say, hey, you know, um, it's going to have an effect not only on your country, on other countries, so please be forthcoming with the truth of what you know, because if it was us in that position, the expectation were that we would share that information. So. It's exacerbated in this case by a cultural issue, though, because the Japanese hate to be embarrassed. It's called yes. losing face, uh, saving face, whatever the, the case may be, mm -hmm. and there are some who suggest that uh, Japan is fudging the numbers just so they don't look bad, because that's the way they're uh, they're designed right but then on the good side of that you're not seeing any fighting or looting or stealing yeah i know they're very calm they're yeah. very polite to each other they understand they're in a difficult position and they're going to try and help each other which is wonderful to see I mean, if you'd seen this in any third world country this would be a completely different situation mm -hmm. so it's amazing to see how calm the japanese public are actually being in this situation with family members lost homes lost everything they have no water no heat in the freezing cold hardly any food to eat and they're still remaining calm right. and completely civilized so that's an amazing feat of that culture. It's been eerie, though, seeing some of the pictures of Tokyo at night, where you expect to see the the, the town basically looking like Times Square in New York, and instead they're utterly and completely deserted. It's amazing. It is, yeah. And you can only imagine what it might look like London or New York or mm -hmm. even Sao Paulo, Brazil, to be just deserted like that. It's uh, it's uh, it's been it was one week uh, since the earthquake at. Uh, 
I think it'd be about 12:45 a.m. today, our time. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've now so we're that many hours, six or seven hours past the uh, one week uh, anniversary of this uh, this thing, and I I'm pretty sure there are areas that they still have been unable to reach because the roads and bridges are washed out, and the only access to to some of these areas is by helicopter. And when you when you see the pictures, the devastra- devastation. You can't describe it. You have to see no. the pictures to believe it. Right, absolutely. And I think uh, the numbers show a lot because they're showing that f- currently the, the number of dead compared that are confirmed compared to the number of missing is completely disproportionate. The police are saying there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people they can't, uh, you know, can't account for. So do we know that they're dead? Do we know that they're just in communication? They can't get in communication with anybody because you don't know. Um, so the numbers that seem to be climbing day by day at a very fast pace and it's going to be a very sad day when we finally get to the end of this because it's going to be a very, very high death toll. Prime Minister of uh, Japan, uh, Natao Khan, uh, gave an address which uh, concluded just a few moments ago. His main message, according to the BBC, was uh, one of resolve and respect for the Japanese people. Quoting him, after World War II, we had a miraculous economic growth thanks to efforts of the Japanese people, and that is how the uh, nation of Japan was built, he said. He also extended his sympathies to the evacuees who continue to live uh, in shelters and, in, in other cases, in bitter cold in camps in the country's uh, northeast. And that's been another aspect of the story. They just can't catch a break at all. I was watching uh, NHK English. They, they've been a tremendous source of information for this. That's the Japanese broadcasting uh, company. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they're, they're English-speaking arm, they speak better English than, well, certainly than I do. It's amazing because <laughs> right. they're, they're Japanese people. But uh, I've been, uh, their meteorologist the other day said, we typically don't get snow at this time of year on the Pacific coast of Japan, but this year they did. And there were a couple of nights overnight this week where they got two or three inches of snow, temperatures in the upper 20s. And, and so to have that on top of everything else, people are trying to survive either outdoors or in homes that don't have electricity, and it's it's just been uh, yeah, just terrible. It doesn't help any of the um, people going over there to, to help find survivors either. I mean, um, lots of right. countries sending out help, and um, they're going into even more difficult conditions, not only because of the devastation, but because of the weather. So absolutely not great news for them. All right, uh, Nikki, you've got a note here. Uh, you always give us uh, some uh, some uh, prepared material, talking points, if you will, to go over. I appreciate that because <laughs> otherwise I'd just be sitting here babbling even worse than uh, I would normally be. But uh, Britain's newest high-fashion model scouted at Waterstones. I'm not sure what Waterstones is. You can tell me. But a 17-year-old from Essex has become the newest face of high-fashion label Prada after being spotted by a fashion scout. And then we have uh, pictures of this uh, young man, Alexander Beck, and he appears to be working at uh, some sort of a convenience store or a little restaurant. And then there he is on uh, the runway. And i got to tell you something. This guy's ugly. (laughs) (laughs) This is not a good-looking guy. I don't get it. He's not my cup of tea either, but uh, very young, 17. Yeah. And Waterstones is uh, a bookstore, a book retailer. And uh, this, the picture you see of him is actually in a fish and chips shop, which oh, is very okay. yeah. common. Sure. Um, and, yeah, he was not going into fashion. He was working part-time, going to school, and um, was scouted and said, yeah, he dropped everything and went to Italy and France and China, and he's been doing all these covers for Vogue and being paid millions of dollars all of a sudden. So was it this not like a dream come true? This is something like, hey, would you like to try? this oh they said he was perfect um the clothes fit him perfectly they couldn't believe they'd found him it looks like um, twiggy he is very skinny but he's you know 17 he's not quite developed yet uh-huh so yeah yeah All but right. you know that's what prada wanted for their face i suppose the uh-huh. number one look <laughs> well you know what i see that all the time though and uh, I'll, I'll see a model and uh, you know for some it doesn't matter high f- high end or whatever just some catalog and think how could this person possibly be considered a model, but uh, the, the, the people who make these selections, uh, you know, beauty's in the eye of the uh, beholder, right? There you go. All right. So, anyways, uh, what else we got going on? Well, we're out of time. I know. Oh, what well, just blew by. It did, didn't it? I enjoyed it, Nikki, as <laughs> always. Great to, great to <laughs> see you, you in your Rich. bright, shining eyes. Thank you. All nice right. to see you, too. Thank you very much. Nikki Hale here with us in the studio. It's Michigan's Morning Show with Michael Patrick Shields. Oh, Rich Kincaid in for Michael Patrick. And we're coming to you from the American Metal Roof Studio.